uh, Philip Levine, <coughs> Peter Everwine, Chuck Moulton, Sam Pereira, Dixie Salazar, John Weinberg will be reading on Sunday night there. And also a classical guitarist and flamingo guitarist, Joey Costello. So come down there. And uh, furthermore, uh, in a couple of weeks or a month, let's see. That's uh, March 5th. Uh, here at the Art Museum, uh, C.G. Hanselcheck and Susan Loomis. And then uh, April 2nd, Corinne Hales and Lisa Whelan, fiction writer. And, and then in May, uh, Philip Levine and Stephen Schick, percussionist, and that'll be at the Tower Theater on all of them. Uh, there's so many things that you can say about Bob Mezzi. I've got to say a few things. He says, he says cut it short. I can't do that. Most of you have read all the stats on him. He's, he's been translated into a lot of languages. He's got a number of fine books out, and he's got some with him for sale. Uh, He's won a number of prizes. He's been published all over the place. Uh, I think probably more important to me is you can't really mention the name Robert Mezzi in this town uh, of Fresno that I know and that we know uh, without evoking uh, some amount of nostalgia. Uh, a nostalgia of one man relating to an entire city. Uh, he was an active poet in active times and uh, became a lightning rod for the conservative uh, and also uh, something of a guru uh, for the ideality of a more rugged and independent communion of thinking and of reaching out beyond the intended scope of a small town college. Uh, he was, an out, he was outspoken, and he was drawing broader outlines for concerning human necessity. Uh, and what is common, what is, what is a communion without a little wine, or in those days, marijuana, little Panama red, homegrown. But of all the niches of imbibers in the... Uh, Socialize, socialization processes of Fresno, I think the poet's niche was probably one of the more innocent. Nevertheless, the outspoken Mezzi took some shots, I think, that he didn't deserve. But he, uh, he probably has his version. Uh, <laughs> I have mine, anyway. But by way of nostalgia, it rings very true to me now that it is definitely not necessary to accept the world's common repudiation or neglect of an individual's higher ideal. And conscience is not the property of Fresno or the world. And it takes courage to uh, reject the compromise. I think the uh, first time I met Bob Mezzi, he was walking across campus dressed in old Levi's naturally faded Levi shirt, boots that weren't shined, backpack and scruffy cowboy hat. <laughs> Jaunty and determined, surrounded by teachers with white shirts and ties and well-dressed students, many of whom were trying very hard to graduate uh, from their lives. <laughs> uh, anyway, Robert Mezzi has given us many poems that confront the obstacles of social progress with anger and force. He's given us poems with wings, poems made with a beautiful, unconditioned uniqueness, poems that cut at the nets that trap us in consumerism, poems of self-elaboration, complex and informed by absolutes, magnetized by unknowns, <coughs> organic, responsive poems that bring differences
closer. Bones that go on trying to release realized desires bottled up inside. The personalizations of the remote. Bones of humorous distortion. Humorous pulverizations. Or should I say humorous pulverizations. They were. He wrote a, a book called White Blossom that was beautifully supported by the community. And uh, the title poem were in Bob Drives Down the Country Road. Uh, with what turned out to be thousands of people in the back seat. Uh, I, uh, he's written some poems that are the favorites of many people in this town and for the sake of the younger generation. I hope he reads some of the oldies but goodies from White Blossoms. And for the sake of impounded nostalgia. Uh, and he's got new poems and translations. He's one of the best translators around. Anyway, uh, all I hope is Bob, that Bob Messi just gets up here and does his thing, whatever it is. Nostalgia is not the word I would have chosen myself, but thank you, Charles, for a generous introduction. So I should confess, I suppose, that I'm really more interested in poetry than in consumerism or social progress. But uh, I'm interested in them as long as they're poetical. Uh, I hope you're comfortable. As a, <laughs> it may take a while. Uh, I'd like to begin. Can you hear okay? No? Yes. yes, okay. I'd like to begin, as I usually do, uh, with a few poems by other people. In this case, of a couple of uh, friends. The first of whom uh, is Henry Coulette, uh, who unfortunately died untimely uh, a few years ago whose collected poems Donald Justice and I edited last year uh, in uh, what I think is a wonderful book, his collected poems uh, from Arkansas. Um, and since I'm going to be reading some of my own translations, perhaps I'll begin with one of his. Uh, Henry never translated very much, uh, only a handful of poems as far as I know. Uh, but I, one of his best poems is a translation. It's the uh, first poem from Horace's fourth book of Odes. And uh, one of the reasons that, I, I, that I, it caught my attention was I've been thinking about the past a lot lately. And Peter Everwine and Henry and I were classmates together many decades ago at the University of Iowa in a class where well, we were trying to remember the name of the teacher, Myra. Breckenridge is close. Uh, <laughs> if Phil were here, he would probably remember. Uh, she was a wonderful teacher, and uh, I remember uh, this poem from that class, and uh, many, many, many years later, Henry translated it. Uh, it seems to me rhythmically and in other ways beyond praise. Uh, there are a number of references, but they're very easy, they're, they're, they're no problem at all. I'll explain just two or three. Um, Paulus Maximus, who's mentioned, them, is a rich young man. That's really all you need to know. Um, the Campus Martius is the field of Mars in, in ancient Rome, uh, where there's a temple to the god. And Ligurinus, uh, who's addressed uh, toward the end of the poem, is uh, an adolescent boy who was mentioned in another of Horace's poems uh, and with whom he was in love. Uh, I don't know if Ligurinus is his real name, but he was in love with some young boy uh, to whom he gives the name Ligurinus. Horace, uh, Book 4, Ode 1. Is the ceasefire over, Venus? Spare me, 
spare me. I beg you to remember I am not what I once was when under the gentle thumb of Cinera. Forbear, cruel mother of the Cupids, to put the screws to one now pushing fifty, now cold to your hot breath. Go whither the young are praying up a storm. On purple swans down, go, revel in the house of Paulus Maximus, and seek what you must seek, that someone who would burn most hard, most gem-like. Noble and handsome both, the champion of the divorcee and the widow, a youth of a hundred skills, he shall bear your standards into the hinterlands. And when some giver of gifts, some lavish rival fails, Paulus, laughing, will set you up in marble under a citrus roof near the Alban Lake. There you will breathe only the best of incense, and there be charmed by a concert featuring the lyre, the Berecynthian flute, and the reed pipe, too. There, a boy and a girl will dance in your honor twice a day, day in, day out, the dance of the Salian, and shake the earth three times with a bare foot. Nothing, nor girl, nor boy, the credulous hope of being loved by either, nor grape, the trials thereof, nor flowers fresh upon my brow, delights me. Nothing. Then why, Ligurinus, does a tear now and then trickle down my gray cheek? Why does my eloquent tongue fall with an unbecoming silence among these words? Now, in the dream of night, I hold you captive. Now I pursue you in flight over the grasses of the campus, Martius, O oh, hard-hearted, through the whirling waters. Uh, sometime during the year before uh, Henry Coulette died, um, he and I were talking about a watercolor painting by Donald Justice, our, our friend, poet who's also a painter, uh, called Tea Dance at the Nautilus Hotel, 1925. He worked from a photograph of a tea dance in 1925. A tea dance, as I'm sure most of you know, is just what it sounds like, uh, a dance for young people, very popular in the first few decades of the century, where tea was the official drink, and there were live dance bands, sometimes quite famous ones, like Paul Whiteman or the Dorseys. Uh, and, uh, we were charmed with the Justice painting, and we had a kind of friendly rivalry to see who would write the first poem, or the better poem, on the subject. And uh, he wrote this poem, a very mysterious little poem, although Peter just cleared a couple things up for me. I still don't understand it. <laughs> but, um, it's an it's a, uh, interesting and brief poem uh, called Tea Dance at the Nautilus Hotel, 1925, on a painting by Donald Justice. And he wrote this not long before he died. Uh, there's a very, not the, the colors, of course, are missing, but there's a very, rather nice woodcut on that little sheet uh, of the painting of Donald Justice. Um, the blue-haired lady with the ebony cane, down to the right, out of sight, undergoes gold, as if Midas himself had written the Book of Heirs. As if, as if. Meanwhile, all grace, pure swan, the dancers wend their way among the palms in pastel frocks, silk suits impeccably tailored, bow ties like butterflies, their patents gleaming. What is this ditty called, they ask each other, and whisper rabbit and bear, and whisper hyena. Uh, Henry was a, uh, had a wonderful talent for the short poem, for, ep for the epigram and the short poem, and I'd like to say a couple of those. This is called Women, Women. What do women want, Sigmund Freud wondered, as the clocks hurried him toward his final dream. Women laugh when they hear of the doctor's question. What does the laughter mean, I ask my doctor, and she laughs, tugging her hem over her knees.
Here are a couple of uh, epigrams. Uh, this one is called On the Collected Poems of What's-His-Face. And it's uh, very easy to, to figure out that What's-His-Face is Allen Ginsberg. And uh, this little epigram is probably the most penetrating critical insight yet um, made. Uh, on the Collected Poems of What's-His-Face. 16,000 lines, give or take 16, and no two lines that you can read between. <laughs> and this one, which refers to the Greek myth of Orpheus and Eurydice, uh, Eurydice dies, the loneliness is grand, still, were she to come back, dust rag in hand, Um, I'm very fond of Henry's poems. I could, I could go on for a while, but I'll read one more. Uh, it's called, uh, this is his retirement poem, and, uh, and suitably he gave it the title of Andrew Marvell's retirement poem, The Garden. I do the crossword in my backyard garden. The clue is age. Rags, my tattered companion, Barks at a mockingbird, the bird barks back, a rogue in Rags' fabulous opinion. Age is a lifetime, a chinoiserie of aches and pains, is being slightly vague, the wit of the staircase while falling down. Wisdom, though wisdom may be just fatigue. <laughs> the great world rages at my garden gate, crying my childhood name with siren voices, pressing for one more go at plenitude. Too late, too late, for I have cut my losses. To change as music changes, note by note, recovering the theme and come to closure. Now, that would be an unofficial joy, a private substitute for the world's pleasure. One has illusions even about that. The glories nod, a hummingbird whirs by, towing the purple evening in its wake. Venus regards the garden with a clear eye. Two short poems by Donald Justice. The first uh, one of a series of poems, uh, nostalgic poems, about piano lessons uh, he took as a boy in Miami in the 30s. Uh, there are poems about dance lessons, all kinds of music lessons. This is called Mrs. Snow, his piano teacher. Mrs. Snow. Busts of the great composers glimmered in niches pale stars. Poor Mrs. Snow, who could forget her? Counting the time out in that hushed falsetto, how early we begin to grasp what kitsch is. <laughs> but when she loomed above us like an alp, we little towns below could feel her shadow. Somehow, somehow her nods of approval seemed to matter more than the stray flakes drifting from her scalp. Her etchings of ruins, her mass production mings were our first culture. She put us in awe of things. And once, with her help, I composed a waltz, too innocent to be completely false, perhaps, but full of marvelous cliches. She beamed and softened then. Ah, those were the days. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, Donald Justice's elegy for Henry Coulette called Invitation to a Ghost. And uh, I might say only that um, one of the private pleasures of the poem is that he, uh, six or seven lines echo 
phrases and lines from poems by Borges. As all the years that I've been translating Borges, I've been done has gone. I've gone through the book poem by poem and knows all of them, and so he's incorporated them, which he loves to do. And uh, perhaps later on, I read a few Borges poems. You'll hear some one or two of the echoes, but there are quite a few of them. Invitation to a Ghost for Henry Coulette, 1927 to 1988. I ask you to come back now as you were in youth, all confidence and the silver brushed from your temples. Let it be as though a man could go backwards through death, erasing the years that did not much count or that added up perhaps to no more than a single brilliant forenoon. <sighs> Sit with us. Let it be exactly as it was in those days when alcohol brought our tongues the first sweet foretaste of oblivion. And what should we speak of but verse? For who would speak of such things now but among friends? A bad line, an atrocious line, could make you wince. We have all seen it. I see you again, turn toward the cold and battering sea. Gull shadows darken the skylight. A wind keens among the chimney pots. Your hand trembles a little. What year was that? Correct me if I remember it badly, but was there not a dream, sweet but also terrible, in which Eurydice strangely preceded you, and you went along already knowing the outcome, and then she did turn? Come back now and help me with these verses. Whisper to me some beautiful secret that you remember from life. Peter asked me to read a couple of poems that I hadn't even looked at for 15 years or more. And Chuck wanted me to read some poems from White Blossoms, which I hadn't planned to do. But I will do a couple. I suppose, you know, one should be respectful of one's old poems even if they give you the creeps. <laughs> I was doing the best I could. Uh, here's a little poem uh, that uh, I still like rather well. Uh, I haven't read for a long time called There, a uh, poem of homesickness, I think, uh, that I wrote in Mexico a long, long time ago. There, it is deep summer. Far out at sea, the young squalls darken and roll, plunging northward, threatening everything. I see the Atlantic moving in slow contemplative fury against the rocks, the beaten headlands, and the towns sunk deep in a blind northern light. Here, Far inland, in the mountains of Mexico, it is raining hard, battering the soft mouths of flowers. I am sullen, dumb, ungovernable. I taste myself, and I taste those winds, uprisings of salt and ice, of great trees brought down, of houses and cries lost in the storm. And what breaks on that black shore breaks in me. Well, I'll read another sort of wintry poem that uh, Chuck wanted me to read. And uh, I don't know what I think about it. I haven't really looked at it for a long time. But uh, it's called Night on Clinton. And this uh, Clinton Street in Iowa City. So this must have been about, oh, 1957 or 58. 
And this, uh, there was a famous bar, at least it was famous in Iowa City, uh, that this uh, takes place outside of. Night on Clinton, the bar is closed, and I come to myself outside the door, drunk and shivering. The talking champions, the bedroom killers, the barroom Catholics have all drifted away, and I am standing in a yellowish wound of light. Above the blot my breathing makes on the glass, I look down the darkened bar where the bottles are out of breath, the stale tumblers bunched, and white glistening webs in the pitchers dry up and shrivel. The plastic stools turn in the hot light that bubbles from the big seabird, silent now, and a shape vaguely human moves with a rag and a limp among the tables piled high with surrendered chairs. Nailed on the back wall, a great Canadian elk fixes me with his glazed liquid eyes and the last lights go out. What I see is important now, but I see only the dim half moon of my own face in the black mirror of space and I lay my cheek against the cold glass. Snow is beginning to fall, huge wet flakes that burst from the darkness like parachutes and plunge past the streaming light and melt into the street. Freeze, die, says the veteran wind from the north, but he goes on with his work, the night and the snow, and was not speaking to me. Okay, last last one from these this, these real old ones. This is called to her, and uh, and uh, she in the poem is the moon, the full moon, and the goddess as well, and uh, and the muse, and a number of other things, I suppose. To her, risen above the uncertain bowels in the last breath of daylight. So near she seems that you can touch her with your hand. She rides in the tall blue silence. Her light falls across the fields like drifted snow. The shadow of the pale barn is like something alive, softer than fur. No one acknowledges what is happening. It has happened so many times, and it means nothing. The city lights vault against the night sky far off, and headlights enter and leave the dark. All have their own or other lights to follow. All have their place. Only a dog gives tongue in this outer dark, and the insect nations keep their high-pitched vigil. The gaunt, illiterate sheriff, scratching his nose, looks upward and is reminded of other nights, things done by hands and knives, the flesh laid open, flashed under shirt or dress, and the young boy and girl give up their first nakedness to her as they struggle with their mouths to come together. Things fight and sleep. And this one, stumbling alone in a thicket of wishes, feeling the new bristles on his face, confesses her power from his knees. How else can he explain the inexplicable? When he drove a thousand miles without rest, when he pleaded with his girl, when he ran away, broke his hand, went down on someone's wife, drank and was sick, stole money, walked in the woods, came here to change. If he dare make his voice heard in this luminous darkness, who is there to hear? Only the full moon, and to her, all sounds are music. Uh, a couple of very short poems. The 
This is called Little Poem. Thick spriglets of mistletoe, asthmatic laughter, even disease is beautiful when the eyes are open. I forgot, I usually explain beforehand, in case people usually know this, but forget that mistletoe is a disease, at least if you're a tree. <laughs> Uh, here's another very short poem. I, uh, one of my pet peeves, or I should say hatreds, is uh, American haiku. Uh, or haiku by anybody who is not Japanese, Buddhist, and dead. <laughs> but damned if I didn't go and write one myself. <laughs> and this one uh, alludes to probably the most famous of all haiku. Hey, you frogs, you know a poet name of Basho? No? Well, he knows you. <laughs> well, a couple of... I was going to read some of these little prose things that are full of puns and all, that, that are pretty amusing, some of them, but uh, I have more, really more to read than there's time for. I'll just give you one, very, the shortest one of all, which has probably the best single pun in it. He love her, so he give her a domineering. <laughs> ho, 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 she cuckled. I probably should read the anti-feminist one to sort of balance that out, but I won't. Uh, I won't uh, uh, let me... read a few of these Borges poems. Um, Um, I, about three or four years ago, I fell madly in love with the poems of uh, Jorge Luis Borges, the great Argentine poet, who's much better known for his stories than for his poems, but I, who I think is a much greater poet than a uh, fiction writer. And uh, we've translated about 200 poems now. I'm only going to read a few of them, nine of them. Uh, and uh, except one, which is a little longish, uh, all very short sonnets or of that about that length. Uh, but this first one is interesting enough, I think, uh, to read. Uh, it's called the Golem, uh, and I should say a couple of things about it. The Golem, for those of you not familiar with it, is kind of the Jewish Frankenstein. Uh, and this poem deals with the uh, uh, 18th century Polish uh, uh, Kabbalist, Jewish Kabbalist. I, I won't take time to explain Kabbalah now, except it's just to say it's an intellectual and spiritual discipline that involves uh, very complicated ways of reading scripture. Uh, and like other such disciplines, is supposed to confer magical powers on those who master it. Uh, and some of the great Kabbalists, the rabbis uh, uh, in the early times, according to legend, uh, by their these magical operations in the Bible learned finally the secret name of God, and so were themselves able or attempted to create human life. And the golem was the result. This is about the most famous of those rabbis, Rabbi Loif, Loi sometimes pronounced, uh, from Prague, Czechoslovakian rabbi, late 18th century. And uh, he refers to Plato's book, The Cratylus, in his first line, and uh, which gave me a great deal of trouble because I needed a rhyme which Cratylus would not serve for. Uh, I've done all, mo most of Borges' poems, certainly all the best ones, are in meter and rhyme. And uh, this translation, uh, 
project very foolhardily has attempted to translate them closely and accurately, but also into meter and rhyme in English. Uh, and Kratlis was difficult. Um, but a, a classicist friend told me that in Greek, it's Kratilis, which worked out much better. So it is the, it's what you know as the Kratilis. I don't think there's anything else that you need. Oh, one more thing. He, uh, Borges got this from an early novel about the Golem, um, and not from Gershom Sholem, the great scholar of Jewish mysticism, but then he later read Sholem, and of course he used it in the poem because it's the only rhyme for Golem. <laughs> the Golem. If, as the Greek asserts in his Cretilus, the name is the very essence of the thing, then from the letters of rose, the rose keeps flowering, and from the word Nile, the length of the Nile arises. And made entirely of consonants and vowels, there must be a dread, unspeakable name, the essence of God encoded, which omnipotence guards in its perfect letters and syllables. Adam knew it, and so did the stars over Eden. But afterwards, or so the Kabbalists say, the corrosion of sin wiped it utterly away, and from the generations it was therefore hidden. Of the ingenuity and innocence of men, there is no end. We know there was a time when the people chosen of God sought for the name. Long were the night watches in the ghettos then. Unlike those who insinuate their vague shadow into the vagueness of history, still green and living is the memory of Judah the lion, who was a rabbi in Prague. Thirsting to know for himself what is known to God, Judah the lion got lost in the permutations of letters, their endless, intricate variations, and at last pronounced the name, which is the code which is the portal, the echo, the host, the palace, over an inert clay figure which he kneaded with stiff hands, trying to teach it the secrets of letters, the secrets of time and space. This earthen semblance raised its drowsy eyelids and saw, for the first time, forms and colors which made no sense, drowned hearing about his friend's death, there's a, a, a very s simple sentence in French in it, uh, which for those of you whose French is as bad as mine, I will translate, uh, which means simply, I'm very tired, I'm 4,000 years old. Elegy. This is a prose piece, really, uh, prose poem, I suppose, if there's such a thing. Elegy. Now it is yours, Abramovitz, the singular taste of death withheld from no one, which will be offered to me in this house or across the ocean on the banks of your Rhone, flowing fatally as if it were time itself, that other and more ancient Rhone. Yours too, the certainty that time leaves its yesterdays behind and that nothing is irreparable or the opposing certainty that the days can erase nothing and that there is no act, no dream, that does not cast an infinite shadow. Geneva considered you a jurist, a man of lawsuits and verdicts, but in every word, in every silence, you were a poet. Perhaps this very moment you are leafing through the various books which you did not write, but imagined and gave up on and which for us justify you and in a way exist. During the first war, while men were killing one another, we too dreamed two dreams that were named La Forgue and Baudelaire. We discovered things that all young men discover, ignorant love, irony, a longing to be Raskolnikov or Prince Hamlet, words and sunsets, Generations of Israel were in you when you said to me one time, smiling, Je suis très fatigué, j'ai quatre ans, mille ans. 
This took place on the earth. Useless to guess how old you must be in heaven. I don't know if you are still someone. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, epilogue, and this is an elegy for boyhood poet friend uh, Francisco Luis Bernardes. And uh, two very small notes. <clears throat> he mentions the deep guitar Paredes played. Paredes was a, uh, he was a, a, a compandrito, kind of a gangster political boss. Uh, and they played the guitar, and they were they had a certain kind of vulgar cultivation. Uh, one of the street fighters, and but a powerful man that Borges uh, knew uh, uh, and talked to and wrote poems about. And then he mentions later in the poem Quevedo, the great poet, great Spanish poet. Uh, and I think that's, that's all there, there you need to know. Epilogue. This is a late poem, so it's about, uh, he's going back to the thinking about the 1920s, and he wrote this in the 1980s. Now that the sum of footsteps given to you to walk upon the earth has been fulfilled, I say that you have died. I too have died. I, who recall the very night we made our laughing, unaware farewells, I wonder what on earth has become of those two young men who sometime around 1920-something went looking with naive platonic faith down the long sidewalks of the southern night or in the deep guitar Paredes played or in the lore of street corners and knives or in the dawn which no one has ever touched for the true secret city of Buenos Aires. Brother in the sonorities of Quevedo and the loved numbers of the hexameter, discoverer, as we all were in those days, of that time-worn utensil metaphor, Francisco Luis, my studious old friend, if only you were here to share with me this empty dusk, however impossibly, and help me to improve these lines of verse. Last Borges poem is called The Art of Poetry. And uh, there's a little mistake in it. Borges was blind for most of his adult life. And uh, he, read, he had read everything, but he couldn't uh, obviously do any reading after he went blind. And uh, so, but he remembered everything he'd read. And so he's always working from memory rather than from text. And so he, he often, He'll quote a whole passage from Samuel Johnson in the middle of one of his prefaces, and maybe a couple of words will be wrong. Uh, in this, he has Ulysses spying, catching sight of Ithaca from his boat, which doesn't happen, uh, at least not in, in the Odyssey. But it doesn't matter. The Art of Poetry. Uh, and he mentions, as he does in hundreds of poems, it seems like, Heraclitus, the pre-Socratic philosopher, uh, uh, whom you know uh, probably as the author of, uh, or the, the, the maker of his most famous sentence, which is that you cannot step into the same river twice, which fascinated Borges endlessly. The Art of Poetry. To look at the river made of time and water and to remember time is another river, to know that we too vanish like the river and that our faces flow away like water, to feel that being awake is another sleep that dreams it is not dreaming, that the death that spreads fear in our flesh is the very death that we die every night and call sleep. To see in the day or in the year a symbol of all the days of man and of his years, and to transmute the insult of the years into a music 
a murmuring, a symbol. To see in death a sleep, or in the sunset a melancholy gold, such is poetry, beggared yet immortal, poetry that comes back like the dawn and like sunset. Sometimes in late afternoon a face looks at us from the depths of a dark mirror. Art ought to be like that unblinking mirror, revealing to each of us his own true face. They say Ulysses, sick and tired of marvels, wept with love at the sight of Ithaca, green and simple. Art is that Ithaca of simple green eternity, not marvels. And art is also like the unending river, going yet staying, mirroring the same changeable Heraclitus, who is the same and yet another, like the unending river. Let's see how we're, how we're doing here. Oh, we have plenty of time. I didn't see Phil before the reading, so I didn't have a chance to ask him if he, whether he would mind my reading this poem or not. I don't think he would. Uh, I think he's heard it before. Uh, this is a takeoff on one of his poems, and I, I don't think I've ever published it, and I've, I read it, I've read it very rarely, maybe twice uh, my whole life. Partly because, uh, well, this seems the perfect place to read it because I would imagine that at least half the audience or more knows uh, the poem that it takes off from. Uh, Baby Vion, uh, and I call it a takeoff or a burlesque rather than a parody, uh, because I've always been very fond of Baby Vion, ancient though it is. Uh, but it occurred to me once, a long time ago, that it would be very funny to imagine that the hero of the poem was not a prize fighter, but a writer. Uh, and so my poem is called Baby Liebnitz. And even if you don't know the original, I think it's still, it makes perfectly good sense. It's just better if you know Baby Vion. Baby Leibniz. He tells me he's published in Partisan because he's pink, in Evergreen because he's hip, in Commentary Jew, in Hudson Esthete, everywhere and all the time, and he keeps track. <laughs> he holds up one thick little bibliography to show me he's published all over the world, and there's no mercy in his voice, no humor in the watery gray eyes blurred by mastheads. He asks me to tell him all I can remember of Lionel Trilling, his idol. He talks of the feuds in New York and what came after, the loss of his publisher, the loss of his fellowship, the stacks in the library smelling of failure and reference books, the lists of editors and quarterlies so long he wrote till the notebook filled with addresses. Here they publish, here they publish and not perish. And he points down at the expensive coffee table littered with class mags. He touches my sunglasses, tells me I should never disparage the thick lenses that guard the eyes of the intellectual. <laughs> Tenderly, his fingers wander over his bookcases, and he says how obscure I am, how unread. We stand to end this first and last interview. Sweaty, 316 pounds, five feet two, no bigger than an elephant. He pats my back, kisses my fountain pen, shows me the door, my hypocrite writer, my semblab, my hero, myself made otherwise by 200 pounds and all those publications. Okay, uh, let me come forward in time a bit. Uh, these are still sort of old poems. Uh, well, three or four more. One goes back a 
maybe oh, three years or so, but then a couple of uh, very recent ones. Uh, this is a sonnet called Hardy. It's probably the poet I love most, or I, usually I think I do anyway, the one I keep going back to most often. And um, this, uh, this poem uh, deals with an incident which uh, you can come across in almost all the biographies. Uh, they seem to agree uh, that it's uh, not apocryphal, but the, the, the evidence for it is slender. Um, but apparently, uh, Hardy, uh, although it was a peasant family, they were not at the very bottom of the heap. And, and so uh, they had not only a midwife present, but a doctor. It was unusual in the country among the peasantry in uh, 1940, uh, sorry, 1840. Um, and um, uh, the doctor uh, th th threw Hardy aside as dead to work on the mother who needed help. And uh, luckily for us, the midwife busied herself. Uh, she didn't believe it, and she, re she recovered the child. Uh, and he was sickly for a few years, but he lived to be almost 90, 80, 88 years old. Uh, that's really all you need to know. In fact, the, the poem tells you all that, so that I'm just sort of telling you who the old crone in the poem is in case it's not clear. Uh, but I think it's clear enough. Hardy. Thrown away at birth, he was recovered, plucked from the swaddling shroud, and chafed and slapped, the crone implacable. At last he shivered, drew the first breath, and howled, and lay there trapped in a world from which there is but one escape, and that forestalled now almost ninety years. In such a scene as he himself might shape, the maker of a thousand songs appears. From this it follows all the ironies life plays on one whose fate it is to follow the way of things, the suffering one sees, the many cups of bitterness he must swallow before he is permitted to be gone where he was headed in that early dawn. Uh, now, I suppose, like everybody else, I've written a few poems uh, that were essentially transcriptions of dreams, and uh, they usually don't work out very well. And uh, this one may not either, but this is, very, this is a very recent poem, I have, so I don't know yet. Uh, therefore, I feel free to foist it on you. <laughs> <laughs> Called No Way. Excuse me. I thought I heard someone calling. Honey, was I asleep? Suddenly, there you were, your, hello, your yellow hair shaking, voicing the anger of life. You said I must leave this house, whosoever it was, not mine, not yours. And I did. I went right out into a courtyard, some sort of courtyard, impassive brick rising higher and higher, no way out, no way back in. I'm going to come back to the beginning. This is my, this is not an elegy, I'm still working on that, but this is a poem of mine that deals with Henry Coulette. Uh, and it's a curious little poem uh, because it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's really a dramatic monologue, uh, but it's, it seemed to insist on writing itself in 14ers, which is a very peculiar meter for a dramatic monologue. Um, but it's against my religion to argue with headstrong poems. Uh, so I, I did it, and uh, another very curious thing about it is that the, the poet uh, interrupts. Uh, there's a, one, one of the four stanzas is a kind of inter interjection. 
in the middle of the monologue. It's called One Rhyme Dream, uh, because there's one rhyme, every, all the lines rhyme on a single rhyme word. And uh, this is Henry uh, thinking of his past life, or dreaming of it. One Rhyme Dream. I felt the familiar sadness still, my faithful hanger-on, remembering with what access of joy how I used to run in skinny boyhood like the wind, far from everyone. It may be from the beginning I was beginning to be the one to do all this solitary, with neither daughter nor son, only this book be what it may to spare from oblivion. And yet its pages are haunted by a mother and a son. For all their bitter laughter, however they carry on, they are, it suddenly seems, a way the work of life gets done. I was in a freezing churchyard with some nameless infantrymen. I was kneeling for forgiveness at the hidden feet of a nun. I was waking in a cold sweat, the sentence unbegun. And the last poem I'll read is called Tea Dance at the Nautilus Hotel, 1925. It's uh, the conclusion of my rivalry with Henry. And uh, one of my sorrows is that uh, he died before I could show it to him uh, and ask him if it wasn't better than his. Uh, didn't he think? Uh, this poem had a very interesting genesis. I wanted to write, I, I thought about the poem a long time. I wanted to write one before Henry did, but I just couldn't get an idea for it. And then uh, I heard uh, there's an all women's band from Berkeley say, sang a song that I had heard before from a Bing Crosby movie from the 30s, or early talkie. It may, came out about the time I was born, actually, uh, about Cuba, uh, CU and CUBA. Um, and uh, what was the thing that charmed me about the poem, uh, about the song, was this rhyme uh, with the word panatella. So Cuba, Cuba was where the dark-eyed Stellas light their fellas panatellas. <laughs> and uh, uh, this is really delicious uh, a series of rhymes. And I, I, I thought it suddenly occurred to me that there were umbrellas in the, the, uh, the Don's painting. And I thought, well, that's a good rhyme for panatellas. Panatellas, you know, is a thin, very thin cigar. Um, and uh, I remind you that, that, that the, the, this is dated, 1925, the photograph that Justice painted from is from a tea dance of that year, which, of course, is before he was born, long before I was born, since I'm much younger. Tea dance at the Nautilus Hotel, 1925. Uh, I, now, the, I haven't written many poems of my own these last three or four years because I've given almost all my time to Borges. Uh, which is a good deal. Um, and I thought maybe, since I, I hadn't written for a while, that this would be very Borgesian, <laughs> but it turned out to be Hardy-esque. <laughs> Tea Dance at the Nautilus Hotel, 1925. The gleam of eyes under the striped umbrellas, we see them still after so many years, or think we do, the young men and their dears, bandying forward glances as through masks in the curled bluish haze of panatellas and taking nips from little silver flasks. They sit at tables as the sun is going, bent over cigarettes and lukewarm tea, talking small talk, gossip and gallantry, some of them single, some husbands and wives, laughing and telling stories, all unknowing, they sit here in the heyday of their lives. And some then dance off in the late sunlight, 
lips brushing cheeks, hands growing warm in hands, feet gliding at the lightest of commands, all summer on their caught or sighing breath as they whirl on toward the oncoming night and nothing further from their thoughts than death. But they danced here 65 years ago. Almost all of them must be underground. Who could be left to smile at the sound of the old fangled dance tunes and each pair of youthful lovers swaying to and fro? Only a dreamer who was never there. Thank you very much.